Hi, I'm Mandy Pryor, Executive Director of Southwest Regional Chamber of Commerce, and we are here with the Southwestern PA Business Podcast. Today, I'm going to be bringing on Jason White, Business Relationship Manager for Chase Bank, to discuss what's going on in the banking industry, and he's been obviously a big part of it. So, Jason, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I appreciate you for having me. Sure. And so, can you tell me just a little bit about yourself and your role within Chase Bank? Well, about myself, I'm a native Pittsburgher. Uh, my role at Chase Bank is business relationship manager, as you said. What we are tasked with doing is managing uh, clients at a certain level, one to twenty million dollars um, in gross revenue. Um, what that entails is simply making sure that we're taking care of all the needs of those folks that they are being provided with the attention necessary to help scale their business, and so we cover. A multitude of things for them, anything from lending to cash management, just making sure that we're helping being a partner with them in terms of growing their business. Good. And so, you know, obviously banks, it's a big topic right now where, you know, everybody's been looking at what happened with the three banks, Silvergate, Signature, and Silicon Valley. Um, I'm here to get your opinion on what you think, obviously, has been going on with the banks and going forward and, and what might happen in the future. So I guess we'll start a little bit of, what have you seen out there? What, what have you seen with these banks and what's going on? Yes, ma'am. So um, a lot of people call it a collapse, but really, as you said, it was really boiled down to just a few uh, institutions and some very unique circumstances. Um, obviously, from our perspective as the largest bank in the country, um, we're never in any peril. We're very, very safe. And we'll talk about some other things a bit later that leads to that. But essentially, it was based on two or three dynamics that existed all at once. Uh, the first one is the types of investments that the banks were involved in. Secondly was the interest rate environment, which, as you know, for a long time, we were at historically low rates. And then the Fed over the last 18 months have consistently raised the price of um, or the cost of borrowing money. And when the interest rate rises, it puts pressure on uh, secured income investments. So those things are all with this, are the first two factors that happen. The third is if you have a run on a bank at that point, and when I say run, I mean people all going to the bank at the same time to collect their deposits, it creates a, not artificial, but a, a, an environment in which the, if you don't have the right amount of cash, you then are faced with uh, trying to sell off those investments which have lessened in value, and that can cause the demise of those institutions. And it's, the and, band, and it's the bandwagon effect. Obviously, yes. you've seen It's a Wonderful Life at some point. I would think most <laughs> people have. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened there. They, you know, they all got worried. They all ran into that bank. And so, um, you know, what, what can people do now to kind of make sure that they're safe and that they're, they're investing? So really. um, there's a couple of things. Most of what you saw was just deposits, not necessarily as much on your investment arm. Um, first of all, my opinions are my own, right? So, we, And I'm not a, a licensed investor, so I don't give investment advice, but more banking advice. Um, there's a couple of things that I would do personally and I instruct all my clients to do, and it may sound odd to some people. Um, but first, understanding your, your bank and how they um, invest money and how they grow their money. So. What banks typically do is they'll take in money on like deposits, which are short-term guarantees, and then they invest them in long-term guarantees. So you need to know what they're doing there um, and what their appetite for risk is. Um, and then also the cash on hand for that bank to make sure that your money is secure, even if it is locked into those long-term investments. So for example, 10-year bonds is what really happened with, uh, based on my knowledge with Silicon Valley Bank. So if you lock the money up for 10 years and you want your money now, then they have to sell off those securities or have the cash to cover that. Um, and that's where the difference comes in. And the banks really just make their difference on their money on the difference between your short-term investment, your deposits, and their long-term investments. So how you keep that safe is one, choosing a bank that fits your risk profile. Um, most people in the industry won't tell you, but also sometimes having multiple um, institutions that you're doing business with, and that goes into how you secure your money through um, FDIC insurance, um, because it works a bit differently for 
businesses than it does for um, individuals. And then lastly, what is the financial position of the organization that you deal with? We all like to support local businesses. Small banks do play a role in everything that happens in the industry uh, because um, not everybody does all the same things. However, there's a different risk profile when it comes to the financial security of those uh, institutions. So our particular institution, when people come in to talk about FDIC insurance, I sh walk them through what the profile looks like and why you do the things you do, whether it's personal or business. But then I also explain to them what our cash position is, which is quite frankly, we have more of cash than the FDIC has in cash. So, and it's a large chasm of, <laughs> of difference. So find out who you're doing business with, how they make their decisions. A lot of people like the fact that they can walk in as a brand new business with no history and no financials and borrow money, but those are all so the same things that get you in trouble. So, for example, um, Silicon Valley Bank did a lot of tech startups, and those businesses sure. either take off and become huge financial successes, but a lot of them just burn through the investment go capital. Go up and go back down. Right. So, in that instance, there's a fluctuation in the amount of cash just available to facilitate uh, a run on deposits. And I did, um, you know, I know that a lot of these bank or these these banks had a heavier hand in cryptocurrency. I'm just throwing that out there. I know we didn't yes. talk about that ahead of time. Um, do you think that had any role in it? It did. So each of these situations were different. So, for example, Silicon had one thing. Uh, Signature Bank was heavy in cryptocurrency, very speculative. Last January, let's call it January of 21, and I may be off on the dates, but if you're heavy in crypto and you have Bitcoin, it's selling at $60,000 a share. Eight months later, it's 20000 So if you have money heavily invested in there, then you're waiting for that bounce to come back in order to recover what you've already put in. So a lot of it is speculative uh, investing in things that aren't really known as well because in this particular country, crypto is still in its infancy. So it did have a large part to do uh, based on reporting for what happened with, with Signature. Um, one of the other things is happens with sometimes when these things happen is it also creates opportunities. So those, depending on what happens over time and government intervention, those banks may become part of other institutions and they'll represent a recovery, which you saw in 2008. And also for those of us who are that old, 1987. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of that old. I probably didn't know what was just going me, on back just then. Just me, yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, how is Chase Bank looking? Um, how are they gaining the trust back? Obviously, it's a different client. It, mm -hmm. They weren't people necessarily in, invested in Chase at the time, but maybe they're coming this way. How are you guys making them feel, you know, like things are going to go well and that they don't have anything to worry about? We are a little bit different in the way that we approach things. We give a very personal touch. So where other institutions are having less branches and less people involved in what everybody says is a double dip recession, we're hiring more people, we're opening more branches. Three years ago, there was one branch downtown. In that same year, we opened two, year, two more. By the end of this year, we'll have 27. What that does is show that we're invested in the Pittsburgh community. And what is more important is they're Pittsburgh people. They didn't bring a bunch of people from New York or Los Angeles or That's Chicago nice. in. I like that. So it invests, it's an investment in our community, right? Um, so that you can actually walk in and talk to a person. You're not viewing them on a screen. And it's more of a personal effect. So it's this, one of the reasons I came here from another institution was a very large company with a hometown feel, so to speak. So that's where you get some of those things. Also, on a quarterly basis, obviously they put out the earnings and ours have been consistently strong, gaining year over year. Um, and your stock price usually shows where you're, where you're going in the run on that, excuse me. Um, so the idea that made people safe is giving them what they need versus what you want as a bank. So we do relationships with our customers. It is a partnership and it only works if we're both invested, right? How you know to be invested in us is we're giving you all the options, right? So our, my job in particular, and everybody really at the bank, is to provide you with all the options and some advice, but you actually make the decisions. It is not sell a widget today. And people appreciate that part of it all. 
and we give a lot of things away for free in terms of advice and resources. Um, it's just not as well known in the Pittsburgh community because of how we're in the infancy stage of building this market. How long has Chase Bank been around? If, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's 160 years. Um, but to where the bank is in, there's been several iterations of acquiring other banks and doing other things. Uh, it is uh, one of those things that make you feel good about being involved because you know that it's going to stay around. Um, one of the things I like to say is if the things that happen at those banks happen to us, then the amount of money really wouldn't matter. It'd be more like participating in Hunger Games. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And then one of the other things I like is we cover everybody, right? So we can cover everybody from Azon, Avon to Amazon. So if you're a multinational, several hundred billion dollar company, we have folks for that. If you are a, um, in the emphasis stage of getting started, we have things for that. And it's all just designed about getting you where you need to be in a manner. We have a lot of conversations with folks about learning their business because no two businesses are equal. So... Well, I if, definitely know that through the chamber. No, yes. no two businesses are right. even close to being like... They can be in the like same the industry, market. make exactly the same money, but they're not actually the same. Um, and so when it comes to looking at what they need, we facilitate them. I think the other thing that makes people feel safe is that we are their advice center, but if they need something that we can't provide, we don't just tell them no, we also tell them how to, to either get the yes with us or where to look for the yes. And um, what about inflation rates? Do you see them climbing still? Do you see them stagnating? Do you see them dropping? The industry would suggest that um, inflation will probably be leveling out towards the end of the year. Um, we can't be in a great state forever. Um, people, the reason they call things like interest rates historically low is because they're historically low. They've never been there before. Mm -hmm. And so, we all, I mean, if you pay attention to economics, you always know there's this ebb and flow of how the rates are gonna be. And then it's the reactionary, the market dictates how quickly or slowly we're gonna react to, react to it. And I think the more that we are cautious about things and what everybody tries to watch is like the home uh, selling rates and new builds and things of that nature because it means that people are buying. And um, I think when that stables out, you'll see a good indication that the market is stable as well. Yeah, I, I think that's what everybody's looking for right now is just stability. Mm -hmm. um, things do have a tendency to go up and down you know, market-wise. Mm -hmm. uh, did you see this coming? Did you see the, the banks that had the issues? Did you see it coming? Or maybe you weren't even paying attention because you're involved in, obviously, your own banking industry. So our job is to watch everything that's going on. And can I say I saw the crash coming? No. Nobody obviously saw that or, or it would have been stopped. Um, but you did see the risk that was there, right, in terms of I had a customer talk to me and they came in to speak to us and they told me an interest rate that was offered to them by SVP, which was literally 10 times what anybody else was offering. So you have to wonder how that keeps going. Um, and so it, it concerns us. And honestly, I told the customer the same thing I would tell you or my mom or anybody else that comes in, if they're gonna give you that much, you should take it. But that's why you have multiple relationships with banks, right? Because some things that you're gonna be good at as an institution, we're not going to be and vice versa. Um, we do most of our things in house, right? So we don't have a third party that we go out for any things and we don't do contracts. So it allows us to tailor to what you need, but not to the point that you can just give away interest at that rate. Um, so could you see the, the collapse of those companies coming? Absolutely not. Could you know that they couldn't last like that forever? Well, that, that is the, was the assumption. Absolutely. And what about your customers and new customers coming in? Have they mentioned anything, their concerns about the, the industry or moving so forward? It's actually been a, a blessing and a curse because, you know, it brought us a lot of business, right? Because we were the safe harbor for everyone. Um, and by industry estimates, which we'll never know exactly, but only based on the number of people that have been interviewed, we got about 80 to 90 percent of the money that moved from Silicon Valley back. So it's been good for us. Um, some of the very individuals who were like, well, it's too big, not aggressive enough. When you hit times of um, uncertainty, you look for the safe big place to be. And so it's been good for us. 
Um, we treated with care. We did not solicit any of their business. Obviously, that's not wouldn't be good for the industry. Yeah. But if someone came with questions or wanted to open up accounts or were looking for uh, advice on investments and things of that nature, we steer them in the right direction, show them what we have, and allow them to make a decision independent of uh, you know any goals or things of that nature because we really don't function that way. And so anything else um, that you think Chase does differently that you think people out there, since we have you here today, does should know about uh, why they should be a part of Chase Bank? Um, I think Chase offers you the ability to have the best of both worlds, right? So big where it matters, small where it counts. Um, as I said, most of the people who work here are locals, um, but the bank has this giant engine behind it where it can get things done uh, that other people can't. So for example, um, depending on size and scope, we have a private bank sector. We also have a corporate banking sector. So someone who does, um, you know, $60 million in business isn't trying to go to a branch to get that type of attention. There's a specialty for everything that we do. Um, we also have JP Morgan Investments, which allows uh, folks to do things that are on their personal side. I mean, where they're investing for their futures, which is what most business owners forget as well as individuals. So we give that type of advice. Um, a good portion of the people that we employ in those areas, our financial advisors are also certified financial planners, so they know how to walk you through life events. Um, so I think those are reasons people would come to us. Um, and we do a good job at participating with, and when I say participating, human capital with the events that are going around the communities in which we serve. and from a, depending, no matter where you are, whether it's a low to moderate income or a highly affluent income space, we are well invested in making sure that everybody is taken care of. Um, I just think it's a great place to get good balance. Even something like 401ks where we have, you know, something like our everyday 401k plan and we have traditional 401k plans as well. So if you're a student investor, you want to invest on yourself, we have that platform. And most of the investment firms that are throughout this country and the banks have us in their plans. So that says something about what we're doing from that perspective as well. Um, from a business banking perspective, uh, you're going to get personal attention. You're going to have complete access and you're going to be able to get what you need. Industries matter with us, though, I will say that. So you have to make sure that we do what you do. And that's true of any institution, right? No go to the place who does what you do. So certain types of investment uh, businesses banks can't do because we're still federally re regulated. So those businesses are a bit shaky for every bank. Um, but what you're gonna get with JP Morgan Chase and Chase Bank in particular is just indiv individualized attention and a true and honest assessment of where you're at. And why do you love your job? Um, I get to help people. I like to say I go on field trips every day, right? So I go out, um, I talk to folks about where they are, what issues they're having, and then I provide them with solutions, and then they decide whether we're gonna use it. But whether it's yes, you should come over to us, or no, you're perfect right where you're at, and that's the piece that do most banks miss, because they're always trying to convince someone to come to them. And sometimes you're right where you should be. Um, so I'd like to tell folks, if we can't make your uh, operations more efficient, make you money or save you money, then you probably should stay where you are at. Um, we do a good job of security too, sometimes a little too much of a good job. But um, I like the holding court with people. Kind of what we're doing now is what I do all day. Um, it's just in line with what they may need to run their business. And to see someone grow and then from the, hey, I just got started to Three years from now, they're a customer of mine, and five years from now, they've outgrown me, and they're to the space of corporate banking, and some of those other things are great. And then the community involvement I get to do, that is fantastic for me as well. Um, I just did an uh, event for a woman's organization, and there might have been 100 people in the room, and it was just supporting those people. Made it, it's almost like stealing good karma. Yeah, that's good. You're just, I like that. Good. I is think, there Go I'm ahead. sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, is there anything else that I haven't touched on? So. Uh, well, two things. One, I think that we, you talked about the job. The other thing I was like, I have the saying, you want to be the thermometer, um, excuse me, the thermostat instead of the thermometer. And people always ask what that means. I say, working here, you get to kind of set the temperature. If you're somewhere else, you're just telling people what it is. I like that. 
I think the question you were asking was about um, anything else people should know. Um, one of the things in what you're talking about is FDIC insurance. And yes. I think sit down, people should sit down with their business professional or financial advisor and get a broad understanding of how it actually works from a business perspective versus a personal perspective, because I think that is significantly different. And then some of the things we as individuals and institutions should be doing is teaching folks how to scale their business and how to be prepared to ask for funding, um, what that actually means to the institution that you're going to do business with. Um, those things are important because it's one thing to need money, but it's also important to come as a qualified individual ready to ask for money where it looks like an opportunity for the people you're asking money for versus looking for an opportunity. So if I'm a business owner, having been one myself before, I want to come to a financial institution saying, look at the opportunity I have for you versus look at the opportunity I'm asking you to grant for me. Good, good. I, I mean, I think financial education, financial literacy is huge. People don't know necessarily what they're investing in. They weren't educated in it. So I think continuing education, especially in our region, across the Pittsburgh region, is going to be very helpful to homeowners, to business owners, to everybody in between who doesn't really know exact. They know the basics, but they don't know, you know, all the the what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the nuances. The nuances yeah. that can really make a big difference to you in your mm -hmm. personal and professional life. Yeah, and anecdotally, I had a friend who was building a house, and this is in Texas, and. She had went out and she signed up with the buyer. And she was like, this house is going to be built all this time. And it's in the middle of COVID. She never took into account, hey, what happens if their cost overrun? Is that my responsibility or the builder's responsibility? And one of the other things that she didn't look at, unfortunately, she had me as a friend. I'm like, hey, you might want to lock in a rate because they're going to be rising. And that little difference saves you sometimes hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, depending on how long it takes that house to be completed. So just things like that, I put her in touch with our uh, home lending specialist and they were able to walk her through those things and it didn't cost her a thing. Um, and like I said, in the digital now, as we're doing on TV right now in a podcast, whether it's TV or radio, you, how we do business has changed, right? So are you set to just be in the market that you're in or are you capable of being a global business where you can sell all over the country or all over the world. And if you're going to do that, what things do you need from us as your financial institution or whoever that may be to make that happen for you? And how do we all integrate? So your accountant, your lawyer, your bankers, or in my case, business relationship manager, all should be working in concert as part of your team to help move you forward. And if those folks don't know each other and aren't working towards what's towards your best benefit, some changes probably should be made. Good. Well, thank you, Jason, so much for coming on today. And we'll be sharing you out on Upper St. Clair Community Television as well as several podcasts and social media so everybody can get in contact with you if they have additional questions. Yes, you feel free to share my information. Um, certainly, no matter where you are in the city, actually, no matter where you are in the country, we would be able to help you. So if they either have questions or they know people who have questions, they can certainly feel free to reach out to me and I will facilitate those things for them. Perfect. Well, thank you for coming on today, and I'll share all of that out shortly. No problem. Enjoyed it. All right. Thanks. And thank you for watching the Southwestern PA Business Podcast through the Southwest Regional Chamber of Commerce. I'm Mandy Pryor, Executive Director. Please reach out with any of your questions about this episode. Mm -hmm.